Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us today for the second webinar in our 2020 Spring Affordable Housing webinar series entitled Placed in Service Package Review. If you missed our first webinar with Fred Benuelos on AHP funding opportunities with the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh, be sure to visit our website or our Affordable Housing Gurus blog to view the full presentation from last Tuesday. I'm Elizabeth Harriger, Partner and Director of Affordable Housing Services here at McConley and Asbury, and with me is Josh Vance, Senior Manager and one of the leaders in our affordable housing practice. For those of you who may not know, McConley and Asbury is a team of CPAs and business advisors serving clients from our offices in Camp Hill, Lancaster, and most recently Bloomsburg. We are a recognized leader in Pennsylvania in providing audit, tax, and consulting services to affordable housing developers and property management organizations. We have relationships with the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency and multiple investors and can assist developers in connecting with them or working through issues with them. Our firm currently serves over 125 affordable housing entities, and in addition to providing annual audit and tax services, our services include development cost certifications, 10% tests, 50% tests, and a variety of low-income housing tax credit consulting. I encourage you to check out our affordable housing page on our website to learn more and to subscribe to our Affordable Housing Gurus blog to stay up to date on industry news and best practices. Please feel free to contact us to talk about how we can serve your organization and how we could work together. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started with today's webinar. If you have any questions for us, please submit them through the built-in questions function in the webinar control panel, and we will do our best to answer them either during or after the webinar. There will also be three polling questions throughout the webinar, so be sure to answer those if you're looking to obtain CB CPE credits for today's webinar. And just a brief disclaimer, the information contained in this presentation, both that contained in the slides and that expressed by the presenters, is not intended to be complete and comprehensive. Only guidance received directly from the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency should be relied on. With that, let's get right to our first polling question. Are you planning to take advantage of the 10% test or place and service date extensions available as a result of COVID-19? We'll give you about a minute to select one. Um, again, there's no right answer, no right or wrong answers to any of these polling questions. You just have to answer all three of them if you want to get CPE credit for today's, today's webinar. Um, the 10% the tests have been extended through April 20, through April um, of 2021, and the place and service dates have been extended through December 31st of 2021. So there are some nice um, there are some nice extensions if you need to take advantage of it. But I'm just curious how many people out there, how many organizations need to take advantage if if construction has been significantly slowed down as a result of of the the pandemic it'll it'll be interesting to see the the extent of which those delays occur and, and how many people will actually use use that uh extension so it looks like it's pretty evenly split between <clears throat> taking advantage and not taking not having to take advantage so yeah it'll be interesting to see how it how it shakes out um but yeah, I actually expected more people to, um, to have to take advantage. So that's actually, I think, pretty good news. So let's get into the, um, the topic here of our webinar, the placed in service package requirements. So what is the placed in service package? Why is it required? And what's the deadline? The placed in service package consists of 35 items required by the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency that must be submitted to the agency within 90 days after construction completion in order to get an IRS Form 8609. The checklist is located at the website that we have noted on our slide, and we also provided the checklist to you this afternoon with, with the slides in case you want to refer to that. So if you want to bring it up um, on the website, you will click on the link in our previous slide, and then you'll 
um, come up to a screen on PHFA's website that looks like this, and you will want to select the place and service package there by the, the blue arrow. And then the place and service package list of requirements will come up and it will look like this. Um, and just one other note with this place and service package, this will come up on an Excel spreadsheet and there will be a number of additional um, spreadsheets attached to it that also need to be completed and uh, submitted with the place and service package. And we're going to go over all 35 items, so we will also touch base on all of the additional spreadsheets that you'll see there. We invited Linda Stewart, who is the director of the tax credit division at PHFA, and Chrissy Gerbig, who's a development officer at PHFA. She reviews a lot of the cost certifications that are submitted. We invited them to participate in today's webinar, and they respectfully declined so that they could continue to focus on continuing to process cost certifications, as well as um, handle the work that's associated with the place and service date extensions and the 10% test extensions. But about a year ago, a group of accountants met with PHFA, including Linda and Chrissy, to see if we could help expedite the 8609 process. And uh, Linda and Chrissy said in response to our uh, webinar invite that if we could just reiterate those points that we touched upon at that meeting, if we could reiterate those in our webinar, that would be most helpful to them. So that brings us to PHFA tips and tricks. One of the big things that they ask for is a cover letter to tell your story. In this cover letter, you want to tell them about anything that is unusual, anything that they might not know about, anything that might have come up after you've submitted your last information to the agency. They don't want to be surprised by anything they see in the place and service package. They want to have a heads up on that. And that's not to say that you shouldn't already be talking to them about anything that is unusual that might be going on, but you, you want to include this in your, in your cover letter. They also stress that all items from the list must be included if they are applicable. They said that each item should be clearly labeled. So <clears throat> if I were putting together a place and service package, I think I would put it together similar to how I would put together a tax credit application. There's there's 35 items, so I would put um, I would divide the package up, numbers one through 35, whether I would put it in a binder, or whether I would just binder clip it together, but I would make it clear that this is item number one and this is item number two, so they can easily flip through whether they want to look at item number seven, 15, or 32, they can easily locate it. And they um, do not want incomplete packages submitted. They said this that they said that that is what is holding up the the processing of the 8609s is that they get incomplete packages submitted um, and and they wait they claim that they wait months and months to um, get everything it can be tough to get back in touch with the investor or the I'm sorry the developer and once the developer has moved on to a new project sometimes this can be out of sight out of mind so um, they don't want you to submit your package unless it is complete. And and by taking the checklist and going down and labeling every item one through 35, that's going to ensure that you're submitting a complete package. So item number one on the checklist is the cover letter. So as we said, you want to tell your development story. You also want to include contact information. You want to include the names, the email addresses, and the phone numbers of who PHFA should contact with questions or if they need additional information. You want to address the place and service package to the attention of the tax credit department at PHFA so it directly, it gets to them directly. And um, they said last year at the meeting that we had with them, they expressed some frustration with reaching out to developers and owners for additional information or questions and getting no response, as I had just mentioned. Um, I think that having at least two contact people listed in your cover letter would be wise in case the PHFA email 
would go to spam or the contact person would be on vacation or out for an extended leave. If there's at least a second person on there, you have twice the, the chance of, of getting it and being able to turn around the information that they're looking for timely. So I'm gonna turn it over to Josh here for a little bit to uh, take you through the, the next few items on the list. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and go through the second item on the list that's required by PHFA, and that is the completion of the owner's certificate of place and service date form that is provided with the place and service package from PHFA. Um, this form uh, outlines each building, um, the eligible and qualified basis for the building, and I'm gonna go ahead and pull up exhibit two, um, and, and that way we can take a look at it. But um, just a, a highlight is, is there, there should be one of these forms for each yeah. building. So if the project has five buildings, you will be required to fill out five of these forms, and it includes the date the building was placed in service, the basis, uh, both eligible and qualified basis, which should tie directly to um, and agree with the, the amounts on the cost certification. So if it's a multiple building project, um, it will have a building breakout with the basis for each building, both qualified and, and eligible basis. So, um, and then it's, it's required to be signed. So certainly you wanna make sure you, know, you, you get one of these completed for each building as is required and make sure that it ties to the cost certification and the, the amounts on the cost certification, so. And if you take a look at this slide here, um, we have blue arrows next to a couple of numbers. Um, you can see on the, the slide that there's two lines for eligible basis. You want to make sure that you're using the eligible basis off this second, the second line for eligible basis, because that takes into account any basis boost. Basis boost. Correct. The, uh, the third item that is required to be included in the place and service package is the certificate of occupancy for each building. Um, the one thing that's very explicitly noted in the, in the PHFA instructions is, is that if, if a certificate of occupancy was issued for residential purposes, which in, in, in fact means to be able to move tenants in, um, even if it's a temporary certificate of occupancy, um, that should be the certificate of, certificate of occupancy that is included um, in the place and service package. So you wanna make sure that you kind of dot your I's and cross your T's by um, making sure you have this, the appropriate certificate of occupancy, which is the one that was used for residential purposes, included in the place and service package for each of the buildings. So for multiple building projects, there may be multiple certificates of occupancy that need to be included in the package. The fourth, uh, fourth item that PHFA requires is the development cost certification. Shockingly enough, um, PHFA has provided a specific format. Um, if I'm gonna go ahead and pull up exhibit four, which is the actual PHFA format for the cost certification that they provided. Um, they certainly prefer um, that the, the cost certification is in this format. So um, as you're going through and, and getting your drafts of your cost certification from your, your um, independent auditor, um, you know, please make sure to the extent possible that you follow this format. This is obviously the preferred format for PHFA and it will save questions, but um, with, without having to go through this specifically, it's, it's the, the PHFA format for the cost certification that they, they prefer that, that outlines the basis as, as well as all the specific areas. So um, you're gonna wanna make sure that um, you, you follow that format to the extent possible as you're going through um, and, and getting your drafts and, and approving your drafts and preparing it for um, to be to be submitted to PHFA. The other thing PHFA requires with the cost certification is they require an original bound copy of the cost certification included in the place and service package. So you will just need to make sure that you have um, you know your auditors provide a a bound copy so that it can be um, appropriately submitted because they they will not accept a staple copy or an electronic copy of any sort. So. Um, and if you need somebody to prepare the development cost cert for you, uh, Josh and I could probably recommend a firm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so um, next is the investor letter. Um, we, we can take a quick look at an example here. This is included in the place and service um, package where the list the 35 item list is on PHFA's website. 
they will require a letter from the syndicator investor indicating that the syndicator or investor has reviewed and approved the cost certification. This letter also indicates the first year of the credit period. And um, you can just see there's blanks there that need to be filled in. So you simply need to provide this example to your syndicator for them to um, copy and complete. So going back to the slides, item number six, if there is commercial or condominium space, you'll need to provide a source and use statement for each area. If there are costs, if there are any costs that are prorated between the commercial or condo space and the tax credit space, you want to be sure to provide the calculation or method, methodology for prorating those costs. And just make that clear to PHFA so they understand what, what you've done. Number seven on the list is the financial characteristics form that is required by PHFA um, to be submitted. Um, this form outlines specific subsidies, financing, tax credit information on the on the development. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up the um, exhibit number seven and just kind of take a quick look at that. But um, as you look at it, it, it provides basic basic details surrounding how the, the the financial characteristics of the property various loan types, subsidies, the interest rates of the loans, the sources for construction, financing loans. Um, it's a couple of pages long and then it also in incorporates, you know, any energy tax credits, energy rebates, as well as syndication information related to how um, um, the, the, you know, the, the limited partners and the tax credits involved in the, in the, in the, uh, in the property. So once again, this, this should be filled out um, and included with the place and service package um, and all the information should be readily available to be able to complete this. Um, going back to the slides, um, the eighth item in the place and service package is the certificate certification of subsidies form. This form is um, certainly um, provided within the PHFA website there's a there's a location and a tab for that to be included um, and basically what this form does is that outlines any um, subsidies rental assistance as well as any any subsidies through any loan programs I'm going to go ahead and go to to the exhibit eight and we'll take a quick look at this as well um, as it's to be included in in the package um, it provides instructions. This comes right from the PHFA website, right where it was identified, and then you can complete the source of funds, the varying sources of funds that were used in the building, and then there's also a section related to any rental assistance, number of units, et cetera, that, that need to be included um, in the form, and then the form needs to be um, signed uh, and, and submitted with the, the place and service package. So. And it is the exact same form that was filled out in the at application. So they're just looking to make sure that what you said at application is what happened in the actual deal. So moving on to number nine, the energy rebate analysis form. The energy rebates are new in the past few years. Um, we can go ahead and bring up that form as well. At application, an estimated energy rebate analysis was submitted to PHFA as one of the tabs in the application package. The energy rebates are considered a source of funding and therefore they reduce tax credit basis. The cost cert must include the energy rebates known at that time and another energy rebate analysis form must be completed, signed by the owner and the general contractor and submitted with the place and service package. If you don't know all of the final energy rebates at the cost cert time. We've been told by PHFA that you shouldn't hold up the cost cert in place and service package submission, but that you should include a note on your cover letter that they that these rebates are still fluid and PHFA will then check in with you during their review of your cost cert and place and service package. And if that is your circumstance, I would recommend that you contact your development officer at PHFA and just let them know and make sure they give you the same um, advice that they gave us, which was not to hold it up and to submit it. But I, I really think that's reasonable because if you, it, it could take a while to get all these energy rebates. So if you hold it up, I mean, you could be holding it up for months until you get those all squared away. So 
So number 10 on the list is the development information form. Um, we'll bring that up here. And this is just simply management and rental information. So item 11 is the architect and contractor certification. This has to be signed by the general contractor, the architect, and the owner. And you can see all the signatures there. So that's pretty straightforward. And then going to number 12, this form must be signed also by the architect, contractor, and owner. And you have to attach copies of the selection and threshold criteria forms that were submitted with the original application. Those forms have to be reinitialed and dated by the architect and initialed and dated by the general contractor. So we, we see a lot of comments or a lot of PHFA review comments related to item 12 because there, there's really a lot there, a, a lot of little I's that need dotted and T's that need crossed with who has to initial, what has to be signed, what's new. Um, so you definitely want to read and reread the instructions to make sure this is completed with all the required signatures and information requested. In our meeting last year, PHFA indicated that this is an often missed area and it can hold up the place and service package review as they're going back to the developer to try to, to get this information. So going back to the slides and back to Josh. Number 13 on the list of items that uh, is required by PHFA is uh, the recorded deeds um, and or and or executed extended lease agreement or recorded memorandum of lease for each site um, if it has not been previously submitted. So um, the next several items on the list, uh, PHFA requests and one of the things that they put in their list is if it has not been previously submitted. One of the recommendations we would have for for recorded deeds or lease agreements um, as well as settlement sheets and things like that is if you have previously submitted it with a 10 percent test um, probably very wise to still put a, 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 a bookmark in the place and service package for it and and either include it again or put a memo in to say specifically when you submitted it and who you submitted it to um, certainly you don't want to make any assumptions when you're putting together your place and service package even though you may have already submitted something um, certainly I think the, the the thought process would be to limit the amount of questions or you know you may get from PHFA or belief that your package was not complete so if you can resubmit it certainly do that if you you know know when it was submitted and who it was submitted to put it put a memo in there stating that that way it just kind of covers that item and there's no question that the the, the package was complete and in each item was considered from that perspective. Uh, number 14 kind of goes along with the deed, but it was to submit a copy of the settlement sheet, um, you know, for the purchase of the site if it has not been previously submitted. Certainly, this is one of the items that's requested at 10% test time. Um, and once again, you know, leave leave a, a, a place mark for it and, and put a memo in if you've already provided it stating when and who you provided it to or go ahead and just include it again. But it just ensures that, that there's hopefully, you know, no questions or, or concerns about the completeness of the package if you've addressed all of these 35 items on here in some way, even if it's, you know, referencing who and when it was submitted to. Um, item 15 uh, within the place and service package that needs to be submitted is the final AIA documents um, from the from the contractor, which includes G702, which is the final application and certification for payment. Um, G703 is the continuation sheet, and then G704 is the uh, certificate of substantial completion. So, in order to you know submit your uh, place and service package, you'll need to have your final your final uh, AIA construction invoices and documents for the application and for payment continuation sheet and certificate of substantial completion from the contractor. They want the final documents to show that the construction is 100% complete when you submit it in the place and service package. So um, that's something to, to kind of pay attention to as you're going through and, and putting it together and making sure you have that so you can submit that. Um, number 16 on the list is uh, the change orders, um, in addition to submitting all of the uh, the AIA documents, um, please include a schedule of the change orders that agrees to the cost certification. So once again, as you're putting your change orders together um, and, and providing them to your to your uh, independent auditor, 
please make sure that when you get your, your cost cert finalized that the listing that you have and the listing you submit with the place and service package does tie to the number on the cost certification. Um, and, and you wanna provide a copy of all the approved change orders as well. Um, there's not re a requirement from PHFA to include supporting documentation, but what they do note on their list is to make sure that there's a sufficient description of the work being performed that was performed as part of the change order. Um, for, for PHFA to understand what it is. Um, so certainly if the description is very vague and says earth work, you may want to include some supporting documentations or, or some other information to, to further outline exactly what that was. And that's just one example, but you know, PHFA wants sufficient documentation to understand what, what was being done. In many cases, the change orders have, you know, sub pretty substantial descriptions of what occurred, but um, in the event that there's kind of a, a vague description, you will want to include some some additional supports so the PHFA understands exactly what occurred. So, all right, and moving on. So number 17 is architect contracts. The, uh, this is obvious, the architect contract must match the amount shown on the cost certification, and you'll want to include any addendums or amendments to the contract. And if there are separate contracts for design and construction administration, both of those will, mean, will need to be provided in the place and service package. 18 is the rent up expenses. You'll need to provide a schedule that matches the amount in the cost certification. The PHFA requires a spreadsheet that includes the vendor name, the date of service, the description of service, the invoice number, and the amount. So it would be great um, if you could just submit that with your invoices or, or whatever your accountant asks for, um, if you could submit that form at the time of the cost certification, it should tie right into your GL account. Um, and just know that run-up expenses can only include expenses that have been incurred no earlier than 120 days before the certificate of occupancy for the first building in the development. And I have seen PHFA ask for the run-up expense invoices a number of times. It's not on their official list here, but I would recommend keeping copies of your rental invoices and your spreadsheet just off to the side somewhere so that when you get your request list from PHFA with questions or additional information that they're asking for for the place and service package that you have those ready to go. I, I think it would be easier to do that and then not need them than to have to go back and pull them all and copy them and get them to PHFA if they do need them. I think it's a uh, it's a good point to Elizabeth about you know the expenses not being allowed earlier than 120 days prior to the first certificate of occupancy. We often see rent up expenses for ground breakings and things like that, and and in most instances they they're not allowed. They're they're often with an extended construction period of eight to ten months. When ground breaking happens, those rent up expenses that that may be related to, you know, a a event related to the ground breaking um, are. are certainly not allowed to be part of those those Correct. yeah groundbreaking expenses are not included or yeah you're right anything that could be done really early it's that 120 day window um a couple questions have come in that maybe mm -hmm. we can just touch on before we get to the next polling yep. question here one is are there any exceptions that can be made due to the state by state stay at home orders when it comes to original bound copies PHFA has a link on their website um, to uh, um, a, a, just an ongoing memo that they're keeping that has been addressing all of these questions. And I actually don't remember seeing that on there. So I, I'm guessing at this point, no, but we will send that link out um, in an email to all the participants after the webinar so that you can keep an eye on that. You can, you can look on there for any changes and they, they're updating that. Um, weekly, bi-weekly, as things change. So you can just keep an eye on that. And then any word if the 120 days will be waived in any way due to the pandemic. And I have not heard that. Again, the place where I think that would be would be on, on um, this update list on PHFA's website. And I have not seen that yet. But those are great questions. And um, we will get that link out to you so that you can keep an eye on that. The uh, the 120 days question is definitely interesting as as buildings were beginning to be you know 
there was expected placed in service dates and rent up costs were starting to be incurred and then construction was halted. Um, certainly there's maybe some rent up costs that fall now outside of that window. So that's certainly a, an intriguing question um, related to that. And moving on to our polling question here. Have you, your vacation plans changed as a result of COVID-19? And once again, there's no right or wrong answer to this one. So <laughs> just curious, you know, how, how everybody's managing and how everybody's, um, you know, how, how things have changed for everybody as we've, we've kind of gone through these last few months of somewhat trying times. So Josh, have your vacation plans changed? Yeah, um, I think I was supposed to go uh, uh, to, to Germany in August and that will not be happening as far as I am aware. It was for a wedding and the wedding has been canceled, postponed. So they, yeah. and I'm pretty sure I can't get into Germany and I'm not sure they're going to let me out if I do go there just based on everything <laughs> that's going on. So yeah, that has definitely changed. So yeah, be a lot more kind of staycations over the course of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we um, we were going to go to New York City. I was very excited to see my first Broadway play. Okay. And um, that was in September, but I'm pretty sure we're not going to be going to New York City in September. Yeah, absolutely. So That's let's fun. see what everybody said here. That's an overwhelming yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's very very not, you know not not surprising given the environment that we're in but yeah it's it's changed a lot of people's vacations so yeah. moving on to number 19 on the list um is furnishings and equipment and phfa requests a detailed schedule for furnishings and equipment that matches the amount shown on the cost certification so once again uh, you'll see this throughout as we get into some of these specific items such as rent up furnishings legal and so forth um, they specifically want to make sure it matches the cost certification. I know with sometimes things changing when, when it's, you know, right up to the very end of getting the final cost certification issued, you really want to make sure you're kind of ticking and tying um, this detail that you're providing to PHFA back and forth with the cost search so everything matches. But the listing PHFA requires and wants is, you know, the vendor, the, the date of the, the invoice, the description of what the invoice is, the invoice number, and the amount. So, um, I think that, that they, they specifically do not request um, uh, invoices, specific invoices included with it. But once again, as, as Elizabeth said earlier, it's wise to probably keep those invoices handy. You may get a request from PHFA specific to one or to see them all, depending on what, what uh, you know, they, they note in their review of the cost certification. So um, that's certainly something that, um, you know, I think is, is wise as you're going through and pulling this together is, you know, kind of keeping that detail ready um, because oftentimes it's a quick turnaround when they request something. So moving on to item number 20 on the list, um, legal fees. So PHFA requires a schedule of the legal fees that match the cost certification. Um, those of you who have been through a cost certification in the past know that, you um, there is a breakout of, of the legal costs in the cost certification between um, various areas, development legal, um, acquisition legal, permanent financing legal, um, construction financing legal. There's, there's uh, numerous areas. So um, they do want to see a schedule that matches the cost and the cost certification. So you want to make sure you capture all of those, those individual line items in the, in the, in, uh, the legal legal. Uh, detail matches that um, and it does this request from PHFA does include copies which include the hourly breakdown they do want to see invoice copies so for legal fees you know you'll want to have those pulled together and ready to, to support the amount that's actually recorded um, it, as I said earlier you know those who have been through the cost certification process know that the costs are broken into the following categories so in within that breakout and in those invoices that PHFA requests you'll want to have you know, detail identifying how it got broken out between the real you know, property development, acquisition, construction financing, permanent financing, syndication, and cost of issuance. Uh, so moving on to item number 21, uh, relocation costs. If there's relocation costs uh, that are included in the, the property, 
um, you'll want to make sure you provide a schedule to PHFA again for the relocation costs uh, that matches the cost certification. And it should include the vendor date of service description, invoice number, and amount. So it's a pretty consistent theme over the last few few requests with providing, uh, you know, rent up, furnishings, legal fees, and relocation uh, detail, including specifically what it is. They do note in this in this relocation item on their listing that if staff time um, was included in the relocation, that you include the number of hours, the hourly rate for the staff, as well as the staff's title. Um, and once again, there's no requirement to submit the invoices. PHFA specifically says do not uh, submit them unless specifically requested. Once again, it's probably a, a wise idea to have them ready in the instance that you ask for relocation invoices. Item number 22, mortgages. PHFA requires that you submit just the mortgage notes for all loans to the development. And again, as Josh had said earlier about some of the items that most likely had been submitted prior to the place and service package, I would include a note in the package indicating when and to whom it was submitted so PHFA can easily obtain it. Number 23 is the partnership agreement. Most likely this has already been submitted to PHFA as well. However, I have seen amendments happen between the time the original executed agreement is submitted and the place and service package. And if PHFA doesn't have those amendments, it, it can really kind of throw them into a tizzy and there can be a lot of back and forth. Um, for instance, if, if the general partner equity contribution has changed, PHFA can't tie that into the cost certification from the original partnership agreement. So it's real important that if there are any amendments, you make sure that PHFA has them at the time of the place and service package. You also want to identify the section or pages in the partnership agreement that contain the required language for the reserves. In the application instructions, um, there, there, are, there are specific language listed that has to be included in, in the partnership agreement in order for the reserves to be included in total development costs. And I'm quoting from that application, from those application instructions um, here. In the event the reserve is not used for its intended purpose, any funds remaining in the reserve at the end of the agency's compliance period or sale of the property, whichever is earlier, must be used to reduce any outstanding debt on the development. Or if there is no outstanding debt, the funds must remain with the project to fund capital improvement. So PHFA needs to verify at place and service time that that language is in the partnership agreement. So to make it easier for them, they want you to identify either the section or the pages in the agreement where that language is. And number 24 is bank statements. You need to provide proof that the reserves have been funded those bank statements must be in the name of the partnership and they must have identifiable account names whether it's your operating reserve um, your rental subsidy whatever it might be you just want to make sure that the bank statement shows that number 25 on the list is the executed management agreement as phfa requests that the, the uh the management agreement is uh not only executed but provided to them as part of this in most cases it may have it you know it may have been done at the initial closing um however that being stated they obviously requested on here there may be amendments changes so forth um so you want to make sure you have the executed management agreement and you get it into the place and service package um, so that you have the complete package Twenty six special needs supportive services. If your development received points for special needs or supportive services, you'll need to provide the executed agreement between the service provider and the management agent or owner confirming availability of those services at initial occupancy. So again, PHFA just wants to make sure that what you said in the application would happen is actually happening. escrow agreement if your development received additional developers fee and agreed to use the equity raised on that fee to fund a rental subsidy or supportive services escrow you'll need to submit an executed escrow agreement for that reserve or escrow with the place and service package 
again at application you would have submitted a draft um, but here they want to see the the uh, executed agreement again to see that what you said was going to happen is happening Number 28 on the list is the completed uh, project history forms. There is a part one and a part two. And uh, PHFA on their list of 35 items for the place and service package actually has a link um, that takes you to the most recent version of these forms. So, you know, as you're putting these together, you will want to make sure um, you will want to make sure that you certainly um, get the correct version of the form. Um, we don't have the from a pull-up for uh, Exhibit 28, which is the form. Um, it's uh, several pages long. Um, part one is details about the property name, building addresses, et cetera. Um, you know, specifically tax credit numbers, management agent, site manager, contact information that PHP expects to be filled out. Um, and then part two um, includes specific area, you know, specific aspects for minimum set aside requirements, applicable fraction, um, types of occupancy, square footage, and so forth. Um, so it, it certainly takes a little bit of effort to pull this together. It has you know information on the the, the makeup of the units and so forth. So um, you know, I think you, the the big thing here is making sure you pull both part one and part two, and you complete all aspects of the form. Um, just given the fact that uh, it certainly um, is somewhat detailed, requires a signature and so forth. And and also I would say check PHFA's website to make sure you have the right version of the form. Um, that's the one thing that they did put specifically with this request on the on the listing was a link to where to find the uh, most up-to-date form. So um, certainly it's it's uh, an important part as, as you finish up the property and, and outline the details of everything. Back to the slides. Um, Item number 29 is the PHFA cost certification fee. So the next several items relate to checks that you need to make payable uh, to PHFA when you're submitting your place and service package. There's several of them, but the first one is, is PHFA requires a $1,000 fee for the cost certification, which is payable to PHFA and the check should be made payable to the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency and submitted with the place and service package. Um, Number 30 is the compliance monitoring fee. So the compliance monitoring fee is a, a fee that is, is on the cost certification. It's a separate line item on the cost certification and it is, it is $800 per unit in, in the property and in the project. Um, so it, you know, it varies by individual development. However, um, $800 times the number of units in the, pro, in, in the, in the uh, development, it should be made payable to PHFA and submitted um, the check should be submitted with the placed in service package. Um, and it applies, the one thing that PHFA notes is this fee applies to all units, so it's not just tax credit units, it's, it applies to all units in the development. Um, and then the 31 is the energy benchmarking fee. So um, for you know, the, the listing is any development after 2016, which at this point we're all in development after program year 2016 require a $1,500 payable uh, you know, benchmarking, energy benchmarking fee that's payable to Pennsylvania has and finance agency. So if you kind of recap the last three, you you basically will have a, a check for $1,000 for the cost cert fee, one for $1,500 for the benchmarking fee, and then one for $800 per unit um, for the compliance monitoring fee. And they should be included with the, with the place and service package. So number 32, material participation of a, a minority owned, woman owned, or veteran owned business. We can pull up the uh, form here that you'll need to submit. If your application received points for material participation of a minority owned, woman owned, or veteran owned business, you will need to include this form. Um, can, we, can we pull up that form? With the place and service package indicating that actual participation and also, <clears throat> excuse me, include the required invoices and supporting documentation. So again, this, this was completed and submitted at application and this was um, where you were estimating any minority women or veteran owned business participation. And at, at cost or at place and service, they want to see that that actually happened. So if you aren't sure exactly what PHFA would be looking for, especially with this third party documentation that they're requesting, I recommend that you reach out to your development officer at PHFA and just make sure that what you're going to submit is what they're looking for. 
So moving on to slide 33, tax exempt bond allocation fee. <clears throat> if you're doing a tax exempt bond deal, half of the estimated allocation fee is due with the place and service package and then PHFA will bill you for the final half. Number 34, the RHS requirement. If you're doing a deal with RHS and tax credits, you must provide the actual cost of the development as submitted to RHS on form RD 1923-13. We don't see these real often, but every once in a while we do see a deal. I haven't for the last several years though, but um, we do see one every now and again. And finally, number 35, the indenture of restrictive covenants. <clears throat> you wanna make sure that you are submitting the original recorded indenture of restrictive covenants. And I have seen this hold up place and service packages. So it, it might seem obvious, but sometimes for whatever reason, it can just be challenging to get the original recorded copy and submit it to PHFA. So you'll wanna make sure that you do that. And number 36, additional information. As Josh and I have kind of said going throughout, we've kind of highlighted some things that we think we see um, more often than not that PHFA wants, even though they don't ask for it, which would be rent up invoices, furnishings invoices, relocation invoices. Um, I think I see on almost every single cost cert um, that they ask for the support for your construction loan interest and your bridge loan interest. So I, again, would keep a file of your bank statements that show the interest. And then if you have a spreadsheet allocating between expense and basis, I would keep that handy because I, I think there's a high likelihood that PHFA is going to ask for it. Yeah, I would agree uh, with that. That's probably the most say, common question we, we, we see from PHFA when, when yeah. these costs are, are being reviewed. Yeah, can, can you think of anything else um, off the top of your head that, that they typically ask for I, I think those two are, are the, the biggest ones. Those two are the biggest ones. The one thing I was going to say is we've just gone through this listing is to, to pay attention as you're starting to pull your cost certification information together. And some many of these things can be pulled together kind of in advance, you know, as you're kind of wrapping things up because, you know, you have 90 days from the date the last building was placed in service to, to get your cost cert and place in service package submitted. And if, if the cost certification gets completed five days prior to that 90 day deadline, you will be scrambling to pull some of these together. It, you know, I think Elizabeth, it highlighted when you said about the yeah, indenture of restricted covenants sometimes being difficult to get your hands on. And it's, it's good to kind of run through this list sooner rather than later. I mean, there's many things you can't get pulled together because you're waiting on numbers to be finalized and things, but there's certainly some other things where you can really start to get the information pulled together and, and save, save a little bit of a, a scramble at the end, so to speak. So with that, we will go to our final polling question. What kind of pet do you have? And once again, no right or wrong answer to this. <laughs> we, the options are dog, cat, other, and not having a pet. Some people may have both dogs and cats plus plus other pets so yeah if you know me at all you know I'm a big animal lover so any opportunity I have to talk about our furry friends I'm all over it I uh I know so my Josh dog has really enjoyed this this working from home thing because she's she's <laughs> able to be she has people at home all day so <laughs> I don't know how the transition will go back after you know when, when we're back in the office again but it, it, so far for the last you know two two or so months she's really enjoyed herself <laughs> yeah i'm not sure how i'm gonna go back to a quiet office i'm used to having a snoring cat near me so, <laughs> so just a few more seconds here so that everybody has a chance to um to answer oh that's a pretty even split yeah, it is Dog, cats and i don't have a pet yep <laughs> so that is a, yep good um, questions. <clears throat> there, there was a, um, another couple questions here that came in. Could you repeat the part about the cost savings excess funds after the compliance period? Sh sure. Um, that went with slide. What slide did that go with? Slide twenty-seven. 
Oh no, it's not slide 27. Well, at any rate, yes, we can we can talk about that again. Um, if if there are, if PHFA requires that you have language in your um, oh it's, it's slide 23. PHFA requires that you have language in your partnership agreement with your related to your reserves. So in, in order for your reserves to count in, in total development costs, which doesn't put them in basis, but it puts them in your need calculation, um, for PHFA to recognize your reserves, the application instructions state that um, you have to have this specific language in the partnership agreement saying that any funds remaining in the reserves at the end of the compliance period um, or sale of the property, whichever earlier, has to be used to reduce any debt on the development or um, that the funds will remain in the property. So basically they're just saying the owner can't walk away, you're, you're ensuring that the owner can't walk away with any unused reserves at the end of the compliance period. Um, if you look in the, the 2020 application instructions, um, in the development cost limit section, it's on page 119. There's a, a subheading that says development reserves and this paragraph is right under there. So you can pull that up and, and look at that in more detail. So for the place and service package, PHFA is saying they want you to point them directly to that language in your partnership agreement. Um, and then another question, can you get an extension to submit the place and service package? And if so, how, to, how do you do that? So yes, you can get an extension if you can't get everything done in the 90 days. It's $25 per unit for each 30-day extension, and you can get three, up to three 30-day extensions. Beyond those three 30-day extensions, the price per unit goes up to $50, and there is a maximum on the number of days that you can um, that you can extend. I, I think it I think the maximum is 270 days, but um, we would need to look at the the um, instructions to the place and service package to to verify that. But that the first link that we gave you to the list of the 35 items for the place and service package, the, the extension information is on that spreadsheet. So um, I think with that, we will get ready to wrap up here as there don't seem to be any other questions coming in. Thank you all again for joining us for today's webinar. If you have any further questions regarding today's presentation, please feel free to reach out to Josh or me and we would be happy to assist you. A recap of today's presentation will be posted on our website in a few days. And for those of you who need CPE, look for a survey to complete after the webinar closes and then the certificates for CPE will be sent out within the next two weeks. We hope you'll also join us for the last webinar in our 2020 Spring Affordable Housing Webinar Series, which is next Wednesday, June 17th. Holly Glauser, Director of Development at PHFA, will join us to provide an update on tax credit developments at PHFA, including revised deadlines due to COVID-19, status of the 2020 tax credit application awards, and any other new developments that may have popped up. You can register on Macaulay and Asbury's website or on our Affordable Housing Gurus blog. Thanks again for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.